I'd like to get started. Um, today we're going to talk about GFS, the Google File System paper we read for today. Um, and this will be the first of a number of different um, sort of case studies we'll talk about in this course about how to be, build big storage systems. So the larger topic um, is big storage. Um, and the reason is that storage has turned out to be a key abstraction. Um, you might, you know, if you didn't know already, you might imagine that there could be all kinds of different um, you know, important abstractions you might want to use for distributed systems, but it's turned out that a simple storage interface um, is just incredibly useful and extremely general. And so a lot of the thought that's gone into building distributed systems has either gone into designing storage systems or designing other systems that assume underneath them some sort of reasonably well-behaved big dis uh, distributed storage system. So we're going to care a lot about how, the, you know, how to design a good interface to a big storage system and how to design the innards of the storage system so it has good behavior. Um, and you know, of course, that's why we're reading this paper, just to get a start on that. The, this paper also touches on a lot of themes that will come up a lot in A24, um, parallel performance, fault tolerance, replication, um, and consistency. Um, and, and this paper is, as such things go, um, reasonably straightforward and uh, easy to understand. It's also a good systems paper. It sort of talks about issues all the way from the hardware to um, the software that ultimately uses the system. Um, and it's a successful real-world design. So um, it's a, you know academic paper published in an academic conference, but it describes something that really was successful and um, used for a long time in the real world. So we sort of know that we're talking about something that um, is it's a good, a good, useful design. OK, so um, uh, before I'm going to talk about GFS, I want to sort of talk about the space of distributed storage systems a little bit um, to set the scene. So first, um, why is it hard? Um, there's actually a lot to get right. But for A24, there's a particular sort of narrative that's going to come up quite a lot um, for many systems. Um, Often the starting point for people designing these sort of big distributed systems or big storage systems is they want to get huge aggregate performance, be able to harness the uh, resources of hundreds of machines in order to get a huge amount of work done. Um, so the sort of starting point is often performance. Um, and you know, if you start there, uh, a natural next thought is, well, we're going to split our data over a huge number of servers in order to be able to read many servers in parallel. Um, so we're going to get, sh and that's often called sharding. Um, if you shard over many servers, hundreds or thousands of servers, you're just going to see constant faults, right? If you have thousands of servers, there's just always going to be one down. Um, so we, the faults are just every day, every hour occurrences, and we need automatic. We can't have humans involved in fixing this fault. We need automatic uh, fault tolerance systems. Um, so that leads us to fault tolerance. The, among the most powerful ways to get fault tolerance is with replication. Just keep two or three or whatever copies of data. One of them fails, you can use another one. So um, we want to have tolerance. That leads us to replication. If you have replication, two copies of the data, then you know, for sure, if you're not careful, they're going to get out of sync. And so what you thought was two replicas of the data where you could use either one interchangeably to tolerate faults, if you're not careful, what you end up with is two almost identical replicas of the data. That's like not exactly replicas at all. And what you get back depends on which one you talk to. So that's starting to maybe look a little bit uh, tricky for applications to use. So if we have replication, um, we risk weird inconsistencies. Of course, you know, clever design. You can uh, get rid of inconsistency and make the data look very well behaved. But if you do that, it almost always requires extra work and extra sort of chit chat between all the different servers and clients in the network that reduces performance. So if you want consistency, um, 
you pay for it with low performance. Right, which is, of course, not what we were originally hoping for. And of course, this isn't absolute. You can build very high performance systems. But nevertheless, there's this uh, sort of inevitable way that the design of these systems play out. And it results in a tension between the um, original goals of performance and the sort of realization that if you want good consistency, you're going to pay for it. Um, and if you don't want to pay for it, then you have to suffer with sort of anomalous behavior sometimes. And I'm putting this up because we're going to see this, this loop uh, many times for many of the systems we look, we look at. People are rare, rarely willing to or happy about paying the full cost of very good consistency. OK, so you know, with brought up consistency, um, I'll talk more later in the course about um, more exactly what I mean by good consistency. But you can think of strong consistency or good consistency as being, oh, we want to build a system whose behavior to applications or clients looks just like you'd expect from talking to a single server. Right? We're going to build you know, systems out of hundreds of machines, but um, a kind of ideal strong consistency model would be ah, what you'd get if there was just one server with one copy of the data um, doing one thing at a time. Um, so this is kind of a strong uh, consistency Um, kind of intuitive way to think about strong consistency. So you might think you have one server. We'll assume it's a single-threaded server and that it processes requests from clients one at a time. And that's important because there may be lots of clients sending concurrent requests in. So the server sees concurrent requests. It picks one or the other to go first and executes that request to completion, then it executes the next. So for storage servers, or you know, the server's got a disk on it, and what it means to process a request is either if it's a write request, you know, which might be writing an item or maybe incrementing, incrementing an item. But if it's a, um, a mutation, then um, we're going to go and we have some table of data and you know, maybe indexed by keys and values, and we're going to update this table. And if the request comes in to read, we're just going to you know, pull the right data out of the table. Um, one of the rules here that sort of makes this well behaved is that um, each is that the server really does execute in, in our simplified model, um, executes the request one at a time, and that requests see data that reflects all the previous operations in order. So if a sequence of writes come in and the server processes them in some order, then when you read, you see the sort of you know, value you would expect if those writes had occurred one at a time. Um, the behavior of this is still not completely straightforward. There's some, you know, there's some uh, things that you have to spend at least a second thinking about. So for example, if we have um, a bunch of clients, and client one issues a write of value x and wants it to set it to 1, and at the same time, client two issues a write of the same value but wants to set it to a different of the same key, but wants to set it to a different value. Right? Something happens. Um, let's say client three reads and gets some result. Or client three, after these writes complete, reads, gets some result. Client four um, reads x and gets some, also gets a result. So what result should the two clients see? Well, that's a good question. So these, what I'm assuming here is that client one and client two launch these requests at the same time. So if we were monitoring the network, we'd see two requests heading to the server at the same time. And then sometime later, the server would respond to them. So there's actually not enough here to um, be able to say whether the client would, receive, would process the first request first. Which order, there's not enough here to tell which order the uh, server processes them in. Um, and of course, if it processes this request first, then that means it processes the write with value 2 second. And that means the subsequent reads have to see 2. Whereas if the server happened to process this request first and this one second, that means the resulting value better be 1, and these, these two requests would see 1. Um, so I'm just putting this up to sort of illustrate that um, even in a simple system, 
there's ambiguity. You can't necessarily tell from a trace of what went into the server or what should come out. All you can tell is that um, some set of results is uh, consistent or not consistent with a possible execution. So certainly, there's some completely wrong results we could see go by if, you know, if client three sees a two, then client four had, be had better see a two also. Because um, our model is, well, after the second write, you know, if client three sees a two, that means this write must have been second. Um, and it still had better be, it still has to have been the second write when client four goes to, to read the data. So hopefully all this is just completely straightforward and just as expected um, because it's, it's supposed to be the intuitive model of strong consistency. Okay, and so the problem with this, of course, is that a single server has poor fault tolerance, right? If it crashes or it's disk dies or something, we're left with nothing. Um, and so in the real world of distributed systems, we actually build replicated systems. So, um, and that's where all the problems start leaking in is when we have a second copy of data. So here is... Um, uh, what must be close to the worst replication design. Um, and I'm doing this to, to warn you of the problems that we will then be looking for in GFS. Right? So here's a bad replication design. Um, we're going to have two servers now, each with a complete copy of the data. Now and so on disk, they're both going to have this this table of keys and values. The intuition, of course, is that we want to keep these tables, we hope to keep these tables identical so that if one server fails, we can read or write from the other server. Um, and so that means that somehow every write must be processed by both servers. Um, and reads have to be able to be processed by a single server, otherwise it's not fault tolerant. Right? If reads have to consult both, then we can't survive the loss of one of the servers. Okay, so um, the problem is going to come up. Well, let's suppose we have client one and client two, and they both want to do these writes. Say one of them is going to write one, and the other is going to write two. So um, client one is going to launch its write x1 to both, because we want to update both of them. And client two is going to launch its write x2 to both of them. So what's going to go wrong here? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't done anything here to ensure that the two servers process the two requests in the same order. Right? So that, that's, that's why it's a bad design. So if um, server one processes client one's request first, um, it'll, end up, it'll start with a value of one, and then it'll see client two's request and overwrite that with two. If server two just happens to receive the packets over the network in a different order, it's going to execute uh, client two's request and set the value to two, and then, then it'll see client one's request and set the value to one. And now what a, client, a later reading client sees, you know, if client three happens to read from this server and client four happens to read from the other server, then we get into this terrible situation where you know, they're going to read different values even though our intuitive model of a correct service says they both subsequent reads have to yield the same value. Um, and this can arise in other ways. You know, suppose we try to fix this by making the clients always read from server one if it's up and otherwise server two. Um, if we do that, then if this situation happened, then for a while, yeah, both, everybody who reads might see client, might see value two. But if server one suddenly fails, then even though there was no write, suddenly the value for x will switch from two to one because if server one dies, all the clients will switch to server two. And there'll be just this mysterious change in the data that doesn't correspond to any write, which is also totally not something that could have happened in this sort of simple server model. All right, so of course this can be fixed. The fix requires more communication, usually between the servers or somewhere, um, more complexity. Um, and because of the cost of, inevitable cost of the complexity to get strong consistency, um, there's a whole range of different solutions to get better consistency and a whole range of what people feel is an acceptable level of consistency and an acceptable uh, sort of uh, set of anomalous behaviors that might be revealed. All right, any questions about this 
um, disastrous model here. OK, um, let's switch to talking about GFS. Well, a, lot of, a lot of what doing GFS is doing is fixing this um, to have better but not perfect behavior. Um, OK, so where GFS came from in 2003, quite a while ago, the, actually, at that time, the, the web you know, was certainly starting to be a very big deal, and people were building big websites. Um, in addition, there had been decades of research into distributed systems, and people sort of knew, at least at the academic level, how to build all kinds of highly parallel, fault-tolerant, whatever systems. But there had been very little um, use of the academic ideas in industry. Um, but starting at around the time this paper was published, uh, big websites like Google started to actually build serious distributed systems. Um, and it was like very exciting for people like me who were on the academic side of this to see, uh, see real uses of these ideas. Um, where Google was coming from was, you know, they had some vast, vast data sets, far larger than could be stored on a single disk, like an entire crawled copy of the web or, um, a little bit after this paper, they had giant YouTube videos. Um, they had things like the intermediate files for building a search index. Um, they also apparently kept enormous log files from all their web servers so they could later analyze them. So they had some big, big data sets. Um, they needed both to store them, and they needed many, many disks to store them, and they needed to be able to process them quickly with things like MapReduce. So they needed high-speed parallel access um, to these vast amounts of data. Um, OK, so what they were looking for, one goal was just that the thing be big um, and fast. They also wanted a file system that was sort of global in the sense that many different applications could get at it. One way to build a big storage system is to, you know, you have some particular application in mind, and you build storage sort of dedicated and tailored to that application. And if somebody else in the next office needs big storage, well, they can build their own thing, right? But, um, if you have a universal or kind of global um, reusable storage system, then that means that if I store a huge amount of data, say you know, I'm crawling the web, and you want to look at my crawled web, web pages, um, because we're all, using, we're all playing in the same sandbox, we're all using the same storage system, you can just read my files, you know, maybe access controls permitting. So the idea was to build a sort of file system where anybody, you know, anybody inside Google um, could name and read any of the files um, to allow sharing. Um, in, order to get, uh, in order to get bigness and fastness, they need to split the data. So every file um, would be automatically split by GFS over many servers, so, so that writes and reads would just automatically be fast. As long as you were reading from lots and lots of, reading a file from lots of clients, you get high aggregate throughput. Um, and also be able to, for a single file, be able to have single files that were bigger than any single disk. Because we're building something out of hundreds of servers, we want automatic failure recovery. Um, we don't want to build a system where every time one of our hundreds of servers has failed, some human being has to go to the machine room and do something with the server to get it up and running or transfer its data or something. Well, the system just fix itself. Um, there were some uh, sort of non-goals. Like one is that uh, GFS was designed to run in a single data center. So we're not talking about placing replicas all over the world. Um, a single GFS installation just lived in one, one data center, one big machine room. So um, getting this style of system to work where the replicas are far distant from each other is a valuable goal, but um, difficult. So single data centers, um, this is not a service to customers. GFS was for internal use by um, applications written by Google engineers. So it wasn't, they weren't directly selling this. They might be selling services that used uh, GFS internally, but they weren't selling it directly. So it's just for internal use. Um, and it was tailored in a number of ways for big sequential file reads and writes. You know, there's a whole other domain like, uh, of, of storage systems that are 
optimize for small pieces of data, like a bank that's holding bank balances probably wants a database that can read and write and update you know, 100 byte records that hold people's bank balances. But GFS is not that system. So it's really for big, where big is you know, terabytes or gigabytes. So big sequential, um, not random access. Um, and it also the, has a certain batch flavor. There's not a huge amount of effort to make access be very low latency. Uh, the focus is really on throughput of big, you know, multi-megabyte operations. Um, this paper was published at SOSP in 2003, the top systems academic conference. Um, yeah, it, uh, usually the standard for such papers, such conferences, is they have you know, a lot of very novel research. This paper was not necessarily in that class. The specific ideas in this paper, none of them are particularly new at the time. Um, you know, things like distribution and sharding and fault tolerance were, you know, was well understood how to, how to deliver those. But this paper described a system that was really operating in use at a far, far larger scale, hundreds of thousands of machines, much bigger than any, you know, academics ever built. Um, the fact that it was used in industry and reflected real world experience of like what actually did and didn't work for deployed systems that had to work um, and had to be cost effective. Also, like extremely valuable. Um, the paper uh, sort of proposed a fairly um, heretical view that it was okay for the storage system to have pretty weak consistency. I think the, the academic uh, mindset at that time was that you know, the storage system really should have good behavior. Like what's the point of building systems that sort of return the wrong data? like my terrible replication system. Like, why do that? Why not build systems that return the right data, correct data, instead of incorrect data? Um, but this paper actually does not guarantee uh, to return correct data. Um, and, uh, you know, the hope is that they take advantage of that in order to get better performance. Um, a final thing that was sort of interesting about this paper is its, it's use of a single master. Um, in a sort of academic paper, you probably have some fault-tolerant, replicated, automatic, failure-recovering master. Um, perhaps many masters with the work split open them, but this paper said, look, you know, you, they could get away with a single master and it worked fine. Just out of curiosity, what's kind of the use case for non-consistent behavior? Like why would, like how, why did they consider that appropriate? Well, cynically, you know, who's going to notice on the web that some vote count or something is wrong? Or if you do a search on a search engine, are you going to know that, oh, you know, like one of 20,000 items is missing from the search results or they're in the wrong order? Probably not. Um, so there was just much more tolerance in these kind of systems than there would like in a bank for incorrect data. That doesn't mean that all data in websites could be wrong. Like if you're charging people for ad impressions, you better get the numbers right. But this is not really about that. Um, in addition, some of the ways in which GFS could serve up odd data could be compensated for in the applications. Like where the paper says, you know, applications should accompany their data with checksums and clearly marked record boundaries. That's so that the applications can recover from GFS serving them, maybe not quite the right data. All right. Um, so the general structure, and this is uh, just figure one in the paper. So we have a bunch of clients, um, hundreds, hundreds of clients. We have one master, um, although there might be replicas of the master. Um, and the master keeps the mapping from file names to where to find the data, basically, although there's really two tables. So, um, and then there's a bunch of chunk servers maybe hundreds of chunk servers, each with perhaps one or two disks. Um, the separation here is the master is all about naming and knowing where the chunks are, and the chunk servers store the actual data. So it's like a nice aspect of the design that these two concerns are almost completely separated from each other um, and can be designed just separately with uh, separate properties. Um, the master knows about all the files. For every file, the master keeps track of a list of chunks chunk identifiers that um, contain the successive pieces of that file. Each chunk is 64 megabytes. So if I have a you know, 
gigabyte file, the, the master is going to know that maybe the first chunk is stored here, and the second chunk is stored here, and the third chunk is stored here. And if I want to read whatever part of the file, I need to ask the master, oh, which server holds that chunk? And then I go talk to that server and read the chunk, roughly speaking. Um, all right, so more precisely, um, we need to, turns out if we're going to talk about how the system, about the consistency of the system and how it deals with faults, um, we need to know what the master is actually storing in a little bit more detail. Um, so the master data, it's got two main tables that we care about. It's got one table that maps file name um, to an array of chunk IDs or chunk handles. Um, this just tells you where to find the data or what the, you know, or what the identifiers or the chunks are. So it's not much yet you can do with a chunk identifier, but the master also happens to have a, um, a second table that maps chunk handles, each chunk handle, to um, a bunch of data about that chunk. So one is the list of chunk servers that hold replicas of that data. So each chunk is stored on more than one chunk server. So it's a list um, of chunk servers. Um, every chunk has a current version number. So this master has a, remembers the version number for each chunk. Um, all writes for a chunk have to be sequenced through the chunk's primary. It's one of the replicas. So the master remembers the, um, which chunk server is the primary. And there's also that primary is only allowed to be primary for a certain least time. So the master remembers the um, uh, ex expiration time of the lease. Um, this stuff, so far, it's all in RAM in the master, so it would just be gone if the master crashed. Um, so in order that uh, you'd be able to reboot the master and not forget everything about the file system, um, the master actually stores all of this data on disk as well as in memory. Um, so reads just come from memory, but writes uh, to, to the, at least the parts of this data that had to be reflected on disk, writes have to go to the disk. So, um, and the way it actually managed that is that there's a, the master has a log on disk, um, and every time it changes the data, it appends an entry to the log on disk and um, a checkpoint. Um, so some of this stuff actually needs to be on disk and some doesn't. It turns out, um, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit here, but certainly the array of chunk handles um, has to be on disk. And so I'm going to write NV here for non-volatile, meaning it's got to be reflected on disk. The list of chunk servers, um, it turns out, doesn't because the master, if it reboots, talks to all the chunk servers and asks them what chunks they have. So this is, um, I imagine, not written to disk. The version number, any guesses? Written to disk, not written to disk? This requires knowing how the system works. I'm, I'm, I'm going to vote written to disk, non-volatile. Um, but we can argue about that later when we talk about how the system works. Identity of the primary. Um, Uh, it turns out not, almost certainly not written to disk, so volatile. Um, and the reason is that the master is on reboots and forgets, therefore, since it's volatile, forgets who the primary is for a chunk, it can simply wait for the 60 second lease expiration time, and then it knows that absolutely no primary will be functioning for this chunk, and then it can designate a different primary safely. Um, and similarly, the re lease expiration stuff is volatile. So that means that. Um, Whenever a file is extended with a new chunk, grows to the next 64 megabyte boundary, um, or the version number changes because the new primary is designated, that means that the master has to first append a little record to its log, basically saying, oh, I just added a such and such a chunk to this file, or I just 
change the version number. So every time it changes one of those, it needs to write, write its disk. So this is, the paper doesn't really talk about this too much, but you know, this limits the rate at which the master can change things, because you can only write to your disk however many times per second. Um, and the reason for using a log rather than a database, you know, some sort of B tree or hash table on disk, is that um, you can append to a log very efficiently because um, you only need, you can take a bunch of recent log records that need to be added and sort of write them all in a single write after a single rotation to whatever the point in the disk is that contains the end of the log file. Whereas if it um, were a sort of B tree reflecting the real structure of this data, um, then you would have to seek to a random place in the disk and do a little write. So the log makes it a little bit faster to write the, um, uh, to reflect operations onto the disk. Um, however, if the master crashes and has to reconstruct its state, you wouldn't want to have to reread its log file back starting from the beginning of time, from when the server was first installed, you know, a few years ago. So in addition, the, uh, the master sometimes checkpoints its complete state to disk, which takes some amount of time, seconds, maybe a minute or something. Um, and then when it restarts, what it does is goes back to the most recent checkpoint and plays just the portion of the log that's sort of starting at the point in time when that checkpoint was created. Any questions about the master data? OK. So with that in mind, um, I want to lay out the steps in a read and the steps in the write. And where all this is heading is that I then want to discuss, you know, for each failure I can think of, why does the system or does the system act correctly after that failure? Um, but in order to do that, we need to understand the data and the operations in the data. Okay, so a, if there's a read, um, the first step is that the client, you know, what a read means is that the application has a file name in mind and a, an offset in the file that it wants to read some data from. So it sends the file name and the offset to the master. And the master looks up the file name and its file table, and then you know, each chunk is 64 megabytes, so we can use the offset divided by 64 megabytes to find which chunk. Um, then it looks up that chunk in its chunk table, finds um, uh, the list of chunk servers that have replicas of that data, and returns that list to the client. Um, so the first step is, um, so you know, the file name and the offset to the master, and um, the master sends the uh, chunk handle, let's say H, and the list of servers. So now we have some choice. We can ask any one of these servers. Pick one that's, and the paper says that clients try to guess which server is closest to them in the network, maybe in the same rack. Um, and send the read request to that, to that replica. Um, the client actually caches um, caches this result so that if it reads that chunk again, and indeed the client might read a given chunk in you know, one megabyte pieces or 64 kilobyte pieces or something. So the client may end up reading the same chunk, different points, successive uh, regions of a chunk many times. And so it caches um, which server to talk to for a given chunk so it doesn't have to keep beating on the master, asking the master for the same information over and over. Um, now the client um, talks to one of the chunk servers, um, tells it the chunk handle and offset, and the chunk servers store these chunks, each chunk in a separate Linux file on their hard drive in a sort of ordinary Linux file system. Um, and presumably the chunk files are just named by the handle. So all the chunk server has to do is go find the file with the right name. You know, that'll give it the um, entire chunk and then just read the desired range of bytes out of that file um, and return the data to the client. All right, any questions about how reads operate? Can I repeat number one? 
the step one is the application um, wants to read it particular file at a particular offset within the file, uh, a particular range of bytes in the file, from 1,000 to 2,000. And so it just sends the name of the file and the beginning of the byte range to the master. Um, and then the master looks up the file name in its file table to find the chunk that contains that byte range for that file. Is that good? So I don't know the exact details. My impression is that the, if the application wants to read more than 64 megabytes, or even just two bytes, but spanning a chunk boundary, that the library, so the application is li linked with a library um, that sends RPCs to the various servers. And that library would notice that the read spanned a chunk boundary and break it into two separate reads. And maybe talk to the master. I mean, it may be that you could talk to the master once and get two results or something. but. Logically, at least, it two requests to the master and then requests to two different chunk servers. Yes? Why would the client require the master to read out the chunk instead of the client determining which chunks it needs based on the offset? Well, at least initially, the client doesn't know for a given file what chunks it needs, what chunks. Uh, well, well, it can calculate it needs the 17th chunk. But, but then it needs to know what chunk server holds the 17th chunk of that file. And, and for that, it certainly needs, for that, it needs to talk to the master. And, and okay, so. All right. The, um, I'm not going to make a strong claim about which of them decides that it was the 17th chunk in the file. But it's the master that finds the identifier, the handle of the 17th chunk in the file, looks that up in its table and figures out which chunk servers hold that chunk. Yes? How does the client know which order the, the chunks fit back together? Or maybe I'm missing a, is, yeah, maybe. How does a, Or you mean if the, if the um, client asks for a range of bytes that spans a chunk boundary? Yeah, like if, let's say the file's a gigabyte and each one is only 64 megabytes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so the, the um, well, you know, the client will ask, the, well, the client's linked with this library, this sort of GFS library that knows how to take read requests apart and put them back together. Um, uh, and, and, and so that library would talk to the master and the master would tell it, well, well, you know, chunk seven is on this server and chunk eight is on that server. And then li the library would just be able to say, oh, you know, I need the last couple bytes of chunk seven and the first couple bytes of chunk eight. And then would fetch those, put them together in a buffer, and return them to the calling application. Okay, and all that information has been, that it comes back to the master the first, after that first request. Well, the master tells it about chunks and the library kind of figures out where it should look in a given chunk to find the data the application wanted. The application only thinks in terms of file names and sort of just offsets in the entire file, and the library and the master conspire to turn that into chunks. Okay. Yeah? Sorry, let me get closer here. You say again? So the question is, does it matter which chunk server you read from? So, um, you know, yes and no. <laughs> Notionally, they're all supposed to be replicas. Um, in fact, as, as you may have noticed, or as we'll talk about, they're not, you know, they're not necessarily identical. And applications are supposed to be able to tolerate this, but the fact is that you may get slightly different data depending on which replica you read. Doesn't even try to pick the closest one? Yeah, so the paper says that, um, Clients try to read from the chunk server that's in the same rack or on the same switch or something. Um, yeah. All right, so that's reads. Um, writes are more complex and interesting. Yeah, 
Uh, the application interface for writes is pretty similar. There's just some call, some library you call to make, you make to the GFS client library saying, look, here's a file name and a range of bytes I'd like to write and a buffer of data that I'd like you to write to that, um, that range. Actually, let me, let me backpedal. I only want to talk about record appends. Um, and so I'm going to phrase this, uh, the client interface as the client makes a library call that says, here's a file name, and I'd like to append this buffer of bytes to the file. Right, so this is the record appends that the paper talks about. Um, so again, the client asks the master, um, look, I want to append, sends a master request saying, look, I would like to append to this named file. Please tell me um, where to look for the last chunk in the file. Because the client may not know how long the file is. If, if lots of clients are appending to the same file, because um, we have some big file that's logging stuff from a lot of different clients maybe, you know, no client will necessarily know how long the file is and therefore which offset or which chunk it should be appending to. So you can ask the master, please tell me about the, uh, the servers that hold the very last chunk, um, current chunk in this file. So unfortunately now, the writing, if you're reading, you can read from any up-to-date replica. For writing, though, there needs to be a primary. So at this point, um, the file may or may not have a uh, primary already designated by the master. So we need to consider the case of if there's no primary already and all the master knows, well, if there's no primary. Um, so, um, uh, so one case is no primary. <laughs> Um, in that case, the master needs to find out the set of chunk servers that have the most up-to-date copy of the chunk. Because, you know, if you've been running the system for a long time, if due to failures or whatever, there may be chunk servers out there that have old copies of the chunk from, you know, yesterday or last week that haven't been kept, kept, up, to, kept up to date because maybe that server was dead for a couple of days and wasn't receiving updates. So there's, you need to be able to tell the difference between up-to-date copies of the chunk and non-up-to-date. So the um, first step is to find, uh, you know, find up-to-date. This is all happening in the master. Because the client has asked the master, told the master, look, I want to append to this file. Please tell me what chunk service to talk to. It's all part of the master trying to figure out what chunk servers the client should talk to. So if we find, find up-to-date um, replicas. And um, what up-to-date means is a replica whose version of the chunk is equal to the version number that the master knows is the most up-to-date version number. So the master that hands out these version numbers, the master remembers um, that, oh, for this particular chunk, you know, the uh, chunk server is only up to date if it has version number 17. And this is why it has to be non-volatile and stored on disk. Um, because if, if it was lost in a crash and there were um, chunk servers holding stale copies of chunks, the master wouldn't be able to distinguish between chunk servers holding stale copies of a chunk from last week and a chunk server that holds the copy of the chunk that was up to date as of the crash. That, that's why the master remembers the version number on disk. if you knew you were talking to all the chunk servers. So, the, so, okay, so the observation is the master has to talk to the chunk servers anyway if it reboots in order to find which chunk server holds which chunk because the master um, doesn't remember that. So you might think that um, you could just take the maximum, you could just talk to the chunk servers, find out what chunks and versions they hold and take the maximum for a given chunk over all the responding chunk servers. And that would work if all the chunk servers holding a chunk responded. But the risk is that at the time the master reboots, maybe some of the chunk servers are offline or disconnected or whatever, um, themselves rebooting and don't respond. And so all the master gets back is responses from um, chunk servers that have last week's copies of the block. And the chunk servers that have the current copy haven't finished rebooting or offline or something. But if, those, if the most recent chunk servers are just dead, then that data is lost forever. So, OK, oh, yes. If, um, if the servers holding the most recent copy are permanently dead, if you've lost all copies, 
all of the most recent version of a chunk, then yes. So even if they're offline but really slow, like the mouse pass returns something to the client? No. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so the, the question is, the master knows that for this chunk, it's looking for version 17. Supposing it finds no chunk server, you know, and it, it talks to the chunk servers periodically to sort of ask them, what chunks do you have? What versions do you have? Supposing it finds no server with chunk 17, with version 17 for this, for this chunk, then the master will either say, will either not respond yet and wait, or it will tell the client, look, I can't answer that. <laughs> Try again later. Um, and this would come up if, like, there was a power failure in the building and all the servers crashed and we're slowly rebooting. You know, the master might come up first and you know, some fraction of the chunk servers might be up and other ones would reboot five minutes from now. But um, so, so we have to be prepared to wait. To, and it will wait forever because you, know, you don't want to use a stale version of, that, uh, of a chunk. OK, so the master needs to assemble the list of chunk servers that have the most recent version. Um, the master knows the most recent version stored on disk. Each chunk server, along with each chunk, as you pointed out, also remembers the version number of the chunk that it stores. So that when chunk servers report into the master saying, look, I have this chunk, the master can ignore the ones whose version does not match the version the master knows is the most recent. OK, so um, remember we were the client wants to append. The master doesn't have a primary. It figures out maybe it has to wait for um, the set of chunk servers that have the most recent version of that chunk. Um, it picks a primary. Um, so I'm going to pick one of them to be the primary and the others to be secondary servers among the replicas that have the most recent version. Um, the master then increments um, the version number and writes that to disk so it doesn't forget it if it crashes. And then it sends the primary and the secondaries, um, a mess, each of them a message saying, look, for this chunk, here's the primary, here's the secondaries, you know, the recipient may be one of them, and here's the new version number. So then it tells primary and the secondaries um, this information plus the version number. And the primaries and secondaries all write the version number to disk so they don't forget because you know, if there's a power failure or whatever, they have to report in to the master with the actual version number they hold. Yes? What happens if the master includes the version number and then immediately after all of the um, chunk servers crash? And so when they boot up, the master doesn't find anyone with the current version number? That's a great question. So I don't know. There's hints in the paper that I'm slightly wrong about this. So the paper says, uh, I think your question has explained something to me about the paper. The paper says if the master reboots and talks to chunk servers, and one of the chunk servers reports a version number that's higher than the version number the master remembers, the master assumes that there was a failure while it was assigning a new primary and adopts the, new, the higher version number that it heard from a chunk server. So it must be the case that in order to handle a master crash at this point, that um, the master writes uh, its own version number to disk after telling the primaries. There's a bit of a problem here, though, because if the, what's that? Is there an ACK? Yeah, you need an ACK, otherwise you might still end up writing it and then die. All right, so maybe the master tells the primaries and backups that their primaries and secondaries, that their primary and secondary tells them the new version number, waits for the ACK, and then writes to disk. There's something unsatisfying about this. I don't believe that works because of the possibility that the chunk servers with the most recent version numbers being offline at the time the master reboots. And we wouldn't want the master, the master doesn't know the current version number. It'll just accept whatever highest version number it hears, which could be an old version number. All right, so th this is a, uh, an area of my ignorance. I don't really understand whether the 
master updates its own version number on disk first and then tells the primary and secondary or the other way around. Um, and I'm not sure it works either way. Okay, but in any case, one way or another, the master updates its version number, it tells the primary and secondary, look, your primaries and secondaries, here's a new version number. And so now we have a primary which is able to accept writes. Right? That's what the primary's job is to take writes from clients and organize applying those writes to uh, the various chunk servers. Um, and you know, the reason for the version number stuff is so that the master will recognize um, the, the, the which servers have this new, you know, if, it, if the um, master hands out the ability to be primary for, to some chunk server, we want to be able to recognize um, if the master crashes, you know, that it was that was the primary, that only that primary and its secondaries, which were actually pros which were in charge of updating that chunk, that only those primaries and secondaries are allowed to be chunk servers in the future. And the way the master does this is with this version number logic. Um, okay, so the, uh, the master tells the primaries and secondaries that they're it, they're allowed to modify this block. It also gives the primary a lease, um, which basically tells the primary, look, you're allowed to be primary for the next 60 seconds. After 60 seconds, you have to stop. Um, and this is part of the machinery for making sure that we don't end up with two primaries, uh, which we'll talk about a bit later. OK, so now we have a primary. Now the master tells the client um, who the primary and the secondaries are. Um, and at this point, we're, uh, we're executing in uh, figure two in the paper. The client now knows who the primary and secondaries are in some order or another, and the paper explains a sort of clever way to manage this. In some order or another, the client sends a copy of the data it wants to be appended to the primary and all the secondaries. And the primary and the secondaries write that data to a temporary location. It's not appended to the file yet. After they've all said, yes, we have the data, um, the client sends a message to the primary saying, look, you know, you and all the secondaries have the data. I'd like to append it to this file. Um, the primary maybe is receiving these requests from lots of different clients concurrently. It picks some order, executes the client request one at a time. And for each client append request, um, the primary looks at the offset that's the end of the file, the current end of the current chunk, makes sure there's enough remaining space in the chunk, and then tells, then writes the client's record to the end of the current chunk and tells all the secondaries to also write the client's um, data to the end, to the same offset, the same offset in their chunks. Right, so um, the primary picks an offset, um, all the replicas, including the primary, are told um, to write the new appended record at that offset. The secondaries, they may do it, they may not do it. Right? Maybe they run out of space, maybe they've crashed, maybe the network message was lost from the primary. So if a secondary actually wrote the data to its disk at that offset, it will reply yes to the primary. If the primary collects a yes answer from all of the secondaries, um, so if they all, all of them manage to actually write and reply to the primary saying, yes, I did it, um, then the primary is going to reply, reply success to the client. Um, if the primary doesn't get an answer from one of the secondaries or the secondary replies, sorry, something bad happened, I ran out of disk space, my disk died, I don't know what, um, then the primary replies no to the client. Um, and the paper says, oh, if the client gets an error like that back from the primary, the client is supposed to reissue the entire append sequence, starting again talking to the master to find out the most recent the, um, chunk at the end of the file. So on a no, the client's supposed to reissue the whole record append operation. So, so once the 
Ah, you would think, but they don't. So the question is, geez, you know, the, uh, the primary tells all the replicas to do the append. Yeah, maybe some of them do, some of them don't, right? If some of them don't, then we apply an error to the client. So the client thinks, oh, the append didn't happen. But those other replicas where the append succeeded, they did append. So now we have replicas that don't have the same data. One of them, the one that returned an error didn't do the append, and the ones that returned yes did do the append. So that is just the way GFS works. Yeah, so if a reader then reads this file, they, depending on what replica they read, they may either see the appended record or they may not, if, if the record append failed, right? If the record append succeeded, if the client got a success message back, then that means all of the replicas appended that record at the same offset. If the client gets a no back, then zero or more of the replicas may have appended the record of that offset and the other ones not. So if the client got a no, then that means that some replicas, maybe some replicas have the record and some don't. So what you, which replica you read from, you know, you may or may not see the record. Oh, the, all the replicas have the same, uh, all, all the secondaries have the same version number. So the version number only changes when the master assigns a new primary, which would oh, okay. ordinarily happen and probably only happen if the primary failed. So what we're talking about is, is replicas that have the fresh version number all right, and you can't tell from looking at them that they're missing, that the replicas are different, um, but maybe they're different. And the justification for this is that, yeah, you know, maybe the replicas don't all have that, the appended record, but that's the case in which the primary answered no to the client. So the client knows that the write failed. And the reasoning behind this is that then the client library will reissue the append. So the appended record will show up, you know, eventually the, the append will succeed, you would think, um, because the client will keep reissuing it until it succeeds. And then when it succeeds, that means there's gonna be some offset, you know, farther on in the file where that record actually occurs in all the replicas, as well as offsets preceding that where it only occurs in a few of the replicas. Yes? So if the client has exhausted writes each one of the, the, uh, the, the replicas, um, then what happens to the design is normally like used in a situation where the client is using data center? Because it seems like that's very wasteful of the object center bandwidth if you are writing on two different successful. Oh, so this is a great question. Um, the, the, the exact uh, path that the right data takes might be quite important with respect to the underlying network. And the paper somewhere says, e even though when the paper first talks about it, it claims that the client sends the data to each replica. In fact, later on, it, it changes the tune and says the client sends it to only the closest of the replicas. And then the replicas, then that replica forwards the data to another replica along a sort of chain until all the replicas have the data. And that, path of that chain is taken to sort of minimize crossing of bottleneck inter-switch links in a data center. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if the end fails, then you're saying that the um, client can send it back to the master, the version number is going to get incremented again. No, 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 no. So oh, the, the version number only gets incremented if the master thinks there's no primary. So, it's a, it's, so in the ordinary sequence, there will already be a primary for that chunk, the, 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 uh, the master sort of will remember, oh gosh, there's already a primary and secondary for that chunk, and it'll just, it won't go through this master selection, it won't increment the version number, it'll just tell the client, look, oh, here's the primary, with, with no version number change. So if it fails, then, or like if the My understanding is that if, so, so this is, a, I think you're asking, a, you're asking an interesting question. So in this scenario in which the primary says answered failure to the client, you might think something must be wrong with something and that it should be fixed before you proceed. 
fact, as far as I can tell the paper, there's no immediate anything. The client retries the append. Um, you know, because maybe the problem was a network message got lost. So there's nothing to repair, right? You know, the network message got lost. We should retransmit it. And this is sort of a complicated way of retransmitting the network message. Maybe that's the most common kind of failure. In that case, just we don't change anything. It's still the same primary, same secondaries. The uh, client retries. Maybe this time it'll work, because the network doesn't discard a message. Um, it's an interesting question, though, that if what went wrong here is that one of that there was a serious error or fault in one of the secondaries, what we would like is for the master to reconfigure that set of replicas to drop that secondary that's not working. And it would then, because it's choosing a new primary and executing this code path, the master would then increment the version. Right? And then we'd have a new primary and new working secondaries with a new version and this not so great secondary with an old version and a stale copy of the data. But because that is an old version, the master will, will never, never mistake it for being fresh. But there's no evidence in the paper that that happens immediately. As far as what's said in the paper, the client just retries and hopes it works again later. Eventually, the master will, if the secondary is dead, eventually the master does ping all the trunk servers, will realize that, and will probably then uh, change the set of primaries and secondaries and increment the version, but only, only later. <laughs> yeah. What does the lease do? Does it change the set of primaries? The lease. Um, the least is to the answer to the question, what if the master thinks the primary is dead? Because it can't reach it, right? That's, supposing we're in a situation where at some point the master said, you're the primary. And the master is like pinging the, all the servers periodically to see if they're alive. Because if they're dead, it wants to pick a new primary. The master sends some pings to you, you're the primary, and you don't respond. right? So you would think that at that point, when, gosh, you're not responding to my pings, you might think the master at that point would designate a new primary. It turns out that by itself is a mistake. Um, and the reason for that, the reason why it's a mistake to do that simple, that, to, you know, use that simple design is that I may be pinging you and the reason why I'm not getting responses is because the, there's something wrong with the network between me and you. So there's a possibility that you're alive. You're the primary, you're alive. I'm pinging you. The network is dropping my packets. But you can talk to other clients. And you're serving requests from other clients. You know? And if I, if I, the master, sort of designated a new primary for that chunk, now we'd have two primaries processing rights, but to different copies of the data. And so now we have totally diverging copies of the data. And that's called um, that error having two primaries or whatever processing requests without knowing each, each other. It's called split brain. And I'm writing this in the board because it's an important idea and it'll come up again. Um, and it's caused, or it's usually said to be caused by network partition. Um, that is, some network error in which the master can't talk to the primary, but the primary can talk to clients. Sort of partial network failure. Um, and you know, these are some of the, these are kind of the hardest problems to deal with in building these kind of storage systems. Okay, so that's the problem, is we wanna rule out the possibility of mistakenly designating two primaries for the same chunk. The way the master achieves that is that it, when it designates a primary, it says, it, gives the primary a lease, which is basically the right to be primary until a certain time. The master knows, it remembers, it knows how long the lease lasts, and the primary knows how long its lease lasts. If the lease expires, the primary knows that it expires and will simply stop executing client requests. It'll ignore or reject client requests after the lease expired. And therefore, if the master can't talk to the primary, and the master would like to designate a new primary, the master must wait for the lease to expire for the previous primary. So that means the master is going to sit on its hands for one lease period, 60 seconds. After that, it's guaranteed the old primary will stop operating as primary. Um, and now the master can safely designate a new primary without um, producing this terrible split brain situation. Yeah.
Oh, so the question is, why is designating a new primary bad since the clients always ask the master first? And so the master changes its mind, then subsequent clients will it'll direct clients to the new, to the new primary. Um, well, one reason is that the clients cache. For efficiency, the clients cache the identity of the primary, for at least for short periods of time. Um, even if they didn't, though, the bad sequence is that I'm the, I'm the master. You ask me who the primary is. I send you a message saying the primary is server one. Right? And that message is in flight in the network. And then I'm the master. I, you know, I think somebody's failed, whatever. I think that primary's failed. I designate a new primary. And I send the primary message saying, you're the primary. And I start answering other clients who ask who the primary is, saying that that over there is the primary, while the message to you is still in flight. You receive the message saying, the old primary is the primary. You think, gosh, I just got this from the master. Um, I'm going to go talk to that primary. And without some much more clever scheme, there's no way you can realize that even though you just got this information from the master, it's already out of date. And if that primary serves your modification request, now we have two, and, and responds success to you, right? then we have two conflicting uh, replicas. That again. What happens if you don't have a new file? Like you have a new file and you don't have any replicas? You have a new file and no replicas. Okay, so if you have a new file and no replicas, or even an existing file and no replicas, the you'll take the path I drew on the blackboard. The master will receive a request from a client saying, Oh, I'd like to append to this file. And then well, I guess the master will first see there's no chunks associated with that file. And it will just make up a new chunk identifier, perhaps by calling the random number generator. And then it'll look in its chunk information table and see, gosh, I don't have any information about that chunk. And it'll make up a new record saying, well, it must be special case code where it says, well, I don't know any version number. You know, this chunk doesn't exist. I'm just going to make up a new version number one, pick a random primary and set of secondaries, and tell them, look, you are responsible for this new empty chunk. Please get to work. How many secondaries do you make up? The paper says three replicas per chunk by default. So they have typically a primary and two backups. OK. OK. So. Um, the, the, uh, maybe the most important thing here is just to repeat the discussion we had a few minutes ago. Um, the intentional uh, construction of GFS um, with these record appends is that if we have three, we have three replicas. Um, you know, maybe a client sends in a ap record append for record A, and all three replicas, or the primary and both of the secondaries, successfully append the data to the chunk. So maybe the first record in the chunk might be A in that case, and they all agree because they all did it. Um, supposing another client comes and says, look, I want to append record B. But the message is lost to one of the replicas, the network, whatever throws away that message by mistake. But the other two replicas get the message. One of them is a primary and one of the secondaries. They both append to the file. So now what we have is um, two of the replicas have B, and the other one doesn't have anything. Um, and then um, maybe a third client wants to append C. And maybe, the, remember, that this is the primary. The primary picks the offset. And so the primary is going to tell the, uh, the secondaries, look, you know, write record C at this point. In the chunk, they all write C here. Um, now, the client for B, the rule for a client for B, that for the client that gets an error back from its request, is that it will resend the request. So now, um, the client that asked to append record B will ask again to append record B. And this time, you know, maybe there's no network losses, and all three replicas append record B. 
right? And they're all live. They all have the most fresh version number. Um, and now, if a client reads, you know, what they see depends on which, rec which uh, replica they look at. It's going to see in total all three of the records, but it'll see them in different orders depending on which um, replica it reads. It'll you know, see A, B, C, and then a repeat of B. So if it reads this replica, it'll see B and then C. If it reads this replica, um, it'll see A and then a blank space in the file, padding, and then C and then B. So if you read here, you see C and then B. If you read here, you see B and then C. So different readers will see different results. And um, maybe the worst situation is if some client gets an error back from the primary because one of the secondaries failed to do the append, and then the client dies before resending the request. So then you might get a situation where um, you have record D showing up in um, some of the replicas and completely not showing up anywhere in the other replicas. So you know, under this scheme, we have good properties for, for appends that the primary sent back a successful answer for and sort of not so great properties for appends where the uh, primary sent back a failure. <clears throat> and the records, the replicas can just absolutely be different, hold different sets of replicas. Yes? My reading of the paper is that the client starts at the very beginning of the process and asks the master again, what's the last chunk in this file? You know, because it might, be, might have changed if other people are appending to the file. Uh, yes? Seems easy for the primary to simply send the information uh, in the event that the client dies before being able to retransmit it, um, since it has it. So I can't, you know, I can't read the designer's mind. So, so the observation is the system could have been designed to keep the replicas in precise sync. It's absolutely true, and you will do it um, in labs two and three. So you guys are going to design a system that does replication but actually keeps the replicas in sync, and you'll learn, you know, there's some various techniques, various things you have to do in order to do that. And um, one of them is that um, there just has to be this rule. If, if you want the replicas to stay in sync, um, there has to be this rule that you can't have these partial operations that are applied to only some and not others. And that means that there has to be some mechanism to like, where the system, even if the client dies, where the system says, wait, wait a minute, there was this operation, I haven't finished it yet. <coughs> so you'll build systems in which the primary actually <clears throat> make sure the backups get every message. <coughs> If the first write of B failed, you think the C should go where the B is? Well, it doesn't. You may think it should, <laughs> but the way the system actually operates is that the primary will add C to the end of the chunk, and it's the after B. So even though the write of B failed, uh, there is some chance, let's say, that, that the next write will be C? Yeah, I mean, one reason for this is that at the time the write for C comes in, the primary may not actually know what the fate of B was. Because we may have multiple clients submitting appends concurrently. And you know, for high performance, you want the primary to start the append for B first, and then as soon as it can, you know, at the next offset, tell everybody to do C so that all this stuff happens in parallel. Um, you know, by slowing it down, you could, you know, the, uh, primary could sort of decide to be a totally failed and then send another round of messages saying, please undo the right of B. And that would be more complex and slower. Um, you know, again, the, the justification for this is that the design is pretty simple. It, you know, it, it reveals some odd things to applications. Um, and the hope was that applications could be relatively easily written to tolerate records being in different orders or who knows what. Um, or if they couldn't, 
um, that applications could either make their own arrangements for picking an order themselves and writing you know, sequence numbers in the files or something, or you could just have, a, if the application really was very sensitive to order, you could just not have concurrent appends from different clients to the same file. Right? You could just, you know, uh, files where order is very important, like say it's a movie file, you, know, you don't want to scramble the bytes in a movie file. You just write the file, you write the movie to the file by one client in sequential order and not with concurrent record appends. Um, okay. All right. Um, the, um, somebody asked basically what would it take to turn this design into one which actually provided strong consistency, the consistency um, closer to our sort of single server model where there's no surprises. Um, I don't actually know because you know, that requires an entire new complex design. It's not clear how to mutate GFS to be that design, but I can list for you, list for you some things that you would want to think about if you wanted to sort of upgrade GFS to a, uh, a system that did have strong consistency. One is that um, you probably need the primary to detect duplicate requests so that when this second B comes in, the primary is aware that, oh, actually, you know, we already saw that request earlier and did it or didn't do it, um, and to try to make sure that B doesn't show up twice in the file. So one is you're going to need duplicate detection. Um, another issue is you probably, if a secondary is acting as secondary, you really need to design the system so that if the primary tells a secondary to do something, the secondary actually does it and doesn't just return error. Right? For a strictly consistent system, having the secondaries be able to just sort of blow off primary requests with really no compensation um, is not OK. So either the secondaries have to accept requests and execute them, or if a secondary has some sort of permanent damage, like its disk got unplugged by mistake, this, you need to have a mechanism to like, take the secondary out of the system so that the primary can proceed um, with the remaining secondaries. But GFS kind of does neither, at least not right away. Um, and so that also means that um, when the primary asks secondaries to append something, the secondaries have to be careful not to expose that data to readers until the primary is sure that all the secondaries really will be able to execute the append. So you might need sort of multiple phases in the write. So the first phase in which the primary asks the secondaries, look, you know, I'd really like you to do this operation. Can you do it? But don't, don't actually do it yet. And if all the secondaries answer with a promise to be able to do the operation, only then the primary says, all right, everybody, go ahead and do that operation you promised. And people, you know, that's the way a lot of real world systems, strong consistent systems work. And that trick is called two-phase commit. Um, another issue is that if the primary crashes, there will have been some last set of operations that the primary had launched, started to the secondaries, but the primary crashed before it was sure whether those, all the secondaries got their copy of the operation or not. So if the primary crashes, um, you know, a new primary, one of the secondaries is going to take over as primary, but at that point, the, second, the new primary and the remaining secondaries may differ in the last few operations, because maybe some of them didn't get the message before the primary crashed. And so the new primary has to start by explicitly resynchronizing with um, the secondaries to make sure that the sort of the tail of their operation histories are the same. Um, finally, to deal with this problem of, oh, you know, there may be times when the secondaries differ or the client may have a slightly stale indication from the master of which secondary to talk to, the system either needs to send all client reads through the primary, because only the primary um, is likely to know which operations have really happened, or we need a lease system for the secondaries, just like we have for the primary, so that um, it's well understood that uh, when a uh, secondary can and can't legally respond um, to a client. And so these are the things I'm aware of that would have to be fixed in the system, sort of added complexity and chit chat to make it have strong consistency. Um, and you'll actually, the way I got that list 
was by um, thinking about the labs. So you're going to end up doing all the things I just talked about as part of labs two and three to, to build a strictly consistent system. Um, OK, so let me spend one minute on the, there's actually, I have a link in the notes to a sort of retrospective interview about um, how well GFS played out over the first five or 10 years of its life at Google. Um, so the high level summary is that the most, is that it was tremendously successful and many, uh, many Google applications used it and a, a number of Google infrastructure was built as a la like big file, for example, big table I mean, was built as a layer on top of GFS and MapReduce also. Um, so widely used within Google. Maybe the most serious limitation is that there was a single master, and the master had to have a table entry for every file and every chunk. And that meant as the GFS use grew and there got more and more files, the master just ran out of memory, ran out of RAM to uh, store the files. And you know you can put more RAM on, but there's limits to how much RAM a single machine can have. Um, and so that was the most maybe the most immediate problem people ran into. Um, in addition, the load on a single master from thousands of clients started to be too much. You know, the master can only, CPU can only process however many hundreds of requests per second, especially since it has to write things to disk. Um, and pretty soon there got to be too many clients. Um, another problem was that some applications found it hard to deal with this kind of uh, sort of odd semantics. Um, and a final problem is that the master, there was not an automatic story for master failover. In the, origin, in the GFS paper as we read it. Like, it required human intervention to deal with a master that had sort of permanently crashed and needed to be replaced. Um, and that could take tens of minutes or more. And that was just too long for failure recovery for some applications. OK, excellent. Um, I'll see you on Thursday. And we'll hear more about all these themes over the semester.